Hello, friends. In the short 15 documentary that follows, we will take a deep dive into Jewish traditions, history, and overall identity with an emphasis on food that defines the Jewish communities and people today. Through presentations, demonstrations, interviews, and commentary, we hope to provide you with a deeper understanding and appreciation for Jewish tradition and society. To begin, Caroline presents an overview of Jewish history and culture. In order to understand the significance of the International Jewish Cookbook, it is critical to review Jewish history and its influence on culinary life. With over 4,000 years of history, Judaism is a monotheistic religion with an established covenant. It is a widespread belief that the Messiah will come, and in the meantime, encourages worshippers to do good deeds and avoid evil. Jewish people worship in synagogues, with rabbis leading the congregations and reading the Torah, also known as the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible. Devastatingly, Jews have faced continuous persecution for their faith throughout history. Two significant genocides were the First Crusade in the 9th century and the Holocaust in the 20th century. Both massacres significantly impacted Jewish populations. The medieval Christians sought to eliminate Jewish traditions and religion by conversion, and the Nazis, in an effort to create the Aryan race, murdered over 6 million Jews. Despite these horrors, the Jewish people's resolve and their neighbors' bravery ensured their survival. Today, there are over 11 million Jews in the world, all with varying degrees of devoutness, including Orthodox, Hasidic, Reform, Conservative, Restructionist, and Humanistic. Since the Jewish people were constantly displaced, they had to adapt to regional crops and adjust recipes accordingly. Food and the kosher diet play a significant role in daily life, with their origins based in the Torah, demanding the separation of meat and dairy, and specific preparation of foods. This requirement is why many Jewish families have two kitchens to ensure the food groups are entirely separated and food is not contaminated. Holy days such as Passover, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur include many traditional Jewish recipes and time spent with family and friends preparing meals in celebration of religious devotion. Often, fasting is the way Jewish people observe the High Holy Days, beginning with Rosh Hashanah, a two-day celebration in late September at the start of the Jewish year. Nevertheless, many foods are served post-fast. Rabbis encourage people to eat sweet foods and avoid bitter ones on High Holy Days to have a sweet upcoming year filled with happiness. Most traditionally sweet foods are honey-dipped apples and various honey cakes, and for Jews with an Eastern European background, babkas, which are cinnamon sugar or chocolate cakes, are also served. After Rosh Hashanah, the Ten Days of Repentance, also called the Days of Awe, begin when Jewish people evaluate and repent for their sins. Yom Kippur follows these days as, day -long, as a day-long fast, filled with prayer and devotion to God. Once the Yom Kippur fast ends, there are many celebrations, and some synagogue communities break the fast together with a dairy-only breakfast. Eggs are encouraged at the feast because they symbolize the cycle of life and rebirth. Fish is typically incorporated into many post-fast meals because it is lighter than meat and easier on the stomach after a long fast. Symbolically, fish do not have eyelids, so they cannot blink, symbolizing God's unwavering love for humanity. Lox, bagels, cream cheese, noodle kugler, vegetarian chopped liver, apricot jello, noodle pudding, stuffed cabbage, white fish salad, egg salad, tuna salad, bean salad, hummus, tabbouleh, and fresh fruit are additional components of a traditional post-fast feast. Most recipes for the dishes are passed down through families and various congregation members will contribute to the feasts, thus sharing their family heritage, forgiving, and uniting the community in prayer and reflection. Next, Francesca and Nadia provide a real-life demonstration following an extensive and important book in Jewish literature and culture titled The International Jewish Cookbook. By Florence Kreiser Greenbaum, the book contains 1,600 recipes pertaining to Jewish history and culture, especially dietary restrictions and koshering. We hope you enjoy. The International Jewish Cookbook, published in 1919, compiles recipes from Germany, Hungary, Austria, France, Russia, Poland, Romania, and the American household that appeal to Jewish taste. The cookbook is designed for Jewish housewives, and so the recipes from other countries are tailored to suit the taste of Jewish households. The author keeps in mind the resources of Jewish kitchens, and so the recipes are made economical and practical. The incorporation of substitutes and the recipes being made kosher-friendly acknowledges Jewish dietary laws while also being accessible to a wide range of audiences. The author also employs a straightforward writing style in simplistic yet effective language while also utilizing paragraph structures to articulate the preparation of each dish. We decided to prepare 
two recipes from the cookbook, the French pancake and the potato cake. The recipe for the French pancake calls for three egg yolks, one half teaspoon of salt, one quarter cup of flour, one cup of cold milk, three beaten egg whites, and two tablespoons of butter for cooking the pancake. The recipe requires minimal ingredients and is easy to follow. Interestingly, the recipe does not call for sugar or any other sweeteners to be added. Also, the final step of cooking the pancake over a pan on one side and then baking it in the oven suggests that the deliberate slow cooking process contributes to the final taste and texture of the dish. On the other hand, the potato cake is more reflective of Jewish culinary traditions of combining sweet and savory ingredients. The recipe calls for two-thirds cup of butter and thus follows the rules of typical Jewish dishes as they usually contain large portions of fat to supply the nourishment required for a well-balanced meal. It also asks for two cups of granulated sugar, one half cup of milk, hot mashed potatoes, two cups of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, yolks of four eggs, and their beaten egg whites. The inclusion of chocolate, walnuts, vanilla, jam, and spices like nutmeg, cinnamon, and cloves creates for a richer, more indulgent dessert option. Moreover, both recipes include the technique of separating the yolks and folding in beaten egg whites for a lighter, more fluffy texture. So, the recipes are flexible and adaptable to kosher considerations and provide unique insights into the culinary preferences and dietary habits of Jewish households during their era. To follow our modern day cooking demonstration, John sat down with Shira Brown. Brown owner of the South Bend Hala Company, originally from Mashiv, North Israel, moved to South Bend in 2019 after living in Tel Aviv for 13 years. In their 25-minute interview, the two discussed topics such as the origins of the South Bend Hala Company, prejudices regarding Jewish food and traditions, and religious practices with food. In the first excerpt, Brown defines Jewish food and where Jewish food comes from. A link to the entire interview will be found at the conclusion of this documentary. First question I had, how would you define Jewish food slash cooking? Um, I think it's food that is born out of necessity. Okay. You know, it's shaped by religion cons constructions. Mm. Um, oh, what's the word? Good word but, but religious rules. Yeah, okay. And poverty mm. in a lot of cases. Mm. And, um, you know, um, and also food that goes, is passed down mm. by generations, but also very much affected from the environment where Jews are. Jews were everywhere, so therefore we have Jewish food from every cuisine almost in the world. If it's Indian, Moroccan, Eastern European, mm. Middle Eastern, you can see it all in Jewish cuisine. Okay. Next, John and Shear explore the origins of food made by the South Bend Hala Company specifically, and how Jewish traditions influenced such food. The majority of the accompanying images come from the South Bend Hala Company social media. So, what historical events have impacted the food you make at the South Bend Hala Company? And then, if you want to it, want to phrase differently, the way I have it is uh, like, what path did the food take that led it to basically you serving it now? So. Uh, for me personally? Yeah. So, okay, so I make, so I'm coming from Eastern European food, which mm -hmm. is where my family came after the Holocaust to Israel. Yeah, okay. So, my base is in that cuisine and those flavors. So, um, you know, like I offer um, matzo bowl soup. It's a very Jewish thing, but it's kind of coming from that area of, mm -hmm. of the world. And the challah is, you know, so what? Like, how did it become that Jews made bagels challah? Mm -hmm. It's not like we made it in Judea in the Bible times. Yeah. 
so as you know, there was the diaspora, which was were expelled from their homeland in Judea, which is now Israel. And went all over the world. My family got to Eastern Europe, prob probably for Spain. Like, um, for example, like my grandma and my brother are really dark colored. Um, so I don't know exactly what was the path, but that's where the most recent lineage was from. And so the Jews um, in Europe kind of adopted the, the food that was made there. So like babka is grandma in Polish mm. and um, and Pol Polish have a lot of similar pastries um, and the shaping of the challah is a bread kind of comes from there you can see those breads in Poland and Ukraine and all that um, the thing that makes the challah challah and it doesn't have to be braided and it wasn't in the old times I believe uh, is uh, is there's like a ritual? It's a blessing. You take like a piece of the bread and you give it in the old temple in the viral time. You would kind of give it to the high priest. Mm. And so now when you make challah, we take a little part of it that we don't eat uh, from the dough and you say a blessing. And, and that actually and it's so any bread could be a challah mm. if you do that process. And it's a certain amount of flour in it. Um, but so the being in, in the diaspora, for example, affected the shapes um, or bagels. Why do Jews make bagels? Do you know? I, I, I'm not sure, no. So Jews in Poland, um, and uh, like I'm not a historian, but as far as I know, they weren't allowed to sell bread. So there was like a restriction on Jews, like you're not allowed to sell bread. And so what they did is they um, boiled the the bagel, the mm. bread, which would technically make it not a bread or mm. not a bake, baked yeah. good or something. So that's how kind of like that rolled. Mm. And that kind of came uh, with the juice to the U.S. Okay. and became like a thing. In addition to historical events, it is also important to discuss modern day issues surrounding Jewish food, history, and culture. Francesca provides political and historical context to the ongoing Israel-Palestinian conflict affecting people all over the world. So now that everyone has seen in our documentary, really the inclusion of um, Jewish, our Jewish cookbook, as well as multiple recipes, um, modern day interviews, as well as modern day renditions of multiple recipes, I think it's also important to discuss modern day topics in relation to um, Jewish cooking and Jewish culture. Because, I mean, when we are discussing things pertaining to Jewish recipes, history, themes of diaspora, um, we really do also have to address the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So, I mean, this the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been prevalent in international relations for decades, but this October, tensions escalated to the highest point that they have reached in recent history. And the result of this escalation has included huge humanitarian crises for all communities involved. Uh, but um, particularly severe famine has just recently been declared in northern Gaza. So food insecurity uh, is incredibly rampant, and most traditional and holiday-oriented recipes, whether it be Passover or Ramadan, really cannot be accurately followed um, or prepared due to a lack of ingredients or, in northern Gaza, really just a lack of food in itself. Um, and that's incredibly important to recognize when we're talking about this um, topic, whether it's cookbook, I mean, our class for cookbooks or food, our class is incredibly food oriented. So I think it would be really ignorant if our project didn't address um, really modern day results um, and modern day problems um, in relation to food. So I don't think anyone necessarily would ever like fault a historically oppressed community for wanting a safe haven after experiencing diaspora. But it is also incredibly saddening to see that the creation of the Israeli state um, has included the forceful removal of another pre-existing community. And the refugee crisis of the Palestinian people has been declared a diaspora in itself. So with the diaspora of one group intentionally or unintentionally uh, resulting in the diaspora of another, it is incredibly imperative that the global community continues to advocate for actual ceasefire, not just one on paper, um, and humanitarian resources truly combating food insecurity and just advocating for humanitarian aid itself. Thank you.
On behalf of John, Adia, Francesca, and Caroline, we thank you for listening. As said at the beginning of this documentary, we hope you leave today with a deeper understanding of Jewish history and tradition, and more importantly, the ability to appreciate all cultures through the lens of food. It's been our pleasure.